Thank you very much, uh, Patrick and Erin, for such a concise introduction, uh, especially after Annie's presentation. I'm not sure if there is anything left for me to say about the Rotarian Action Group for Peace, but I will add a few thoughts. First of all, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and it's a great pleasure to see people uh, come forward in support of peace efforts, which are uh, really in the hour of need as we look around our world today and as we observe the various challenges uh, that lie ahead in the uh, joint efforts to build peace. Um, <clears throat> my brief task for today is just to say a few things about the Rotarian Action Group for Peace and then uh, a few reflections on the significance of narratives. You have already heard that the Rotarian Action Group for Peace is a kind of semi-autonomous organization, an international organization that um, has a place under the broader umbrella of Rotary International. Um, its main task is to focus on one of the areas of um, interest of Rotary International, which is entitled Peace, Conflict Prevention and Resolution. So this is the area that the Rotarian Action Group for Peace supports, empowers, develops, um, popularizes uh, to both Rotarians as well as non-Rotarians. Um, it really has to do with building a human infrastructure across the world using the Rotary organization which is uh, quite prolific in its structure and in its orientation because it cuts across cultures, it cuts across religions, it cuts across borders, it cuts across ethnic groups. And in that respect, it provides an infrastructure on which the efforts for peace can be built and promoted. What we have done uh, with the Rotarian Action Group for Peace was to find, search and build ways in which we can bring people together within Rotary and engage them in peace activities uh, and peace-worthy initiatives. Uh, we have attempted to create both a human and an electronic infrastructure that helps Rotarians come together around peace projects, that helps Rotarians become connected to the work of peace fellows who graduate from the Rotary Peace Centers, uh, but also to bring together Rotarians and affiliate organizations to work jointly on peace-related initiatives. Um, to facilitate this, we also created what we call a Peace Hub, which is a website that you can find on www.rotarianactiongroupforpeace.org, <coughs> which has various very interesting dimensions, and I encourage those who are interested uh, to get online and to look at this. <clears throat> what you will find there uh, is first of all a map, an interactive map with key locations in the field of peace which cover a great variety of locations from Rotarians and the activities they are engaged in to where the Peace Fellows are and what they are doing to universities that carry peace programs to the Rotary Peace Centers themselves, uh, and to organizations that work in the various fields of peace. Uh, you will also be able to use a filtering system that can make you focus your search and your connectivity. You can use, for example, a filter that identifies your particular area of peace that you're interested in. You may be interested in peace education or peace and economic development or peace and security. Uh, you can find then the corresponding organizations or the corresponding rotary projects that work in that area. And the map will show you all the locations all across the world. So this is one very powerful interactive aspect of this website. There is also a visual databases uh, for the constituents and uh, with lots of content. Some of them have to do with peace resources around these issues uh, and various other useful information. Uh, there is also a social media component to it through which Rotarians can communicate with each other uh, and with various organizations that are also part of the database. We also have uh, peace resources, as I said, and finally we want to add a 
news feed that will give current updates on peace events. So all these elements come together in what we call the Peace Hub. Uh, and it, again, its intention is to facilitate the promotion of peace, is to make it easy for people to become connected, is to make it available for people who want to engage in peace and are looking for affiliates, are looking for partnerships, are looking for opportunities to become engaged. So now back to our topic of the day. As you have heard, uh, Dr. Uh, Julia uh, Chaitin is going to talk about the importance of narratives uh, focused on a specific area in the world and a specific conflict, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I just wanted to share a few thoughts on the significance of narratives. Narratives are really mental pictures that are created in our minds which really result from our experience. It's the picture and the framework through which we see the world. And this is very normal to human beings. You know, we all create patterns in our minds which become terms of reference uh, from which we then attend the world and we understand things and we classify things and we interpret things. This process does not stop when humans engage in conflict. However, when humans and human groups are engaged in conflict, and that conflict is protracted, the frameworks become shaped in a particular way. They become shaped because as humans experience conflict, the conflict and the priority of conflict in their experience also shapes the narratives. So the narratives are conflict conditioned. And to the degree to which the narratives are conflict conditioned, they become a bad servant to the interest of peace. In, in fact, they become an obstacle to the interest of peace. I will give you just one example from my own background and the work that I have done in Cyprus. One of the big controversies in Cyprus has to do with the Turkish troops, which as a result of you know, decades of conflict, uh, uh, intervened in Cyprus and they have been occupying the northern part of Cyprus to this day, since 1974. That's how long this protracted conflict has been going on. And the big issue, one of the very big issues in the negotiations and in the dialogue on resolving the Cyprus problem is what to do with the Turkish army. When we initiated some of this dialogue in the buffer zone of Cyprus, we discovered that it was so difficult to talk about it because the different sides had different terms to refer to exactly the same phenomenon. The Turkish side used to refer to the presence of the Turkish army as the agent of peace, and the intervention was named the peace operation. For the Greeks, however, on the other side, it was viewed as a fragment violation, a mass violation of human rights, and as a, a violent military intervention and occupation of their country. So how do you talk about it? But again, when we look closely, why is it that the two sides view the presence of the Turkish army so differently? It's because they experienced it in different ways. The Greeks experienced it as an onslaught, as a violent movement of an army that displaced them from their homes in two weeks. The Turkish Cypriots experienced it as a great relief. They say, now we can sleep at night. But the Greeks, they say, now we cannot sleep and rest ever, because just a few miles down the road, there is this huge army that displaced us. So this is how narratives are formed under conflict conditions. And the big challenge, of course, is how do you then bridge these narratives? Because they become so different, they become so polarized, and they become so alienated from each other that there is no base for dialogue, because they have no common points of reference. The challenge of peace builders is to erode these narratives by introducing new narratives that may have a common framework and common points of reference. And one way to do this, of course, is by talking to each other. And that's why the theme for the day is you must listen. Thank you. <laughs>